the Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network presents The Kingdom Driven Family Podcast with your host, Andrea Schwartz. This podcast will equip and empower you to help advance Christ's kingdom through God's primary institution, the family, building a home that serves Christ and His kingdom. Hi, this is Andrea Schwartz, along with my co-host, Nancy Wilk, with our next edition of Homeschooling Helps. And we're finishing the series today, uh, Curriculum Foundations, what the foundations of our curriculum should be. So before we launch into the final episode of this series, Nancy, any comments on what we've already covered? Well, I think that what we've covered so far has been very important in terms of us understanding what is the priority for our curriculum in our education. And um, so I really appreciate you doing this. I think it's a value. And, you know, when we get to the end of this, we're going to think of 87 things that we should have said or wished we talked about. And there'll be plenty of opportunity to do that. And so um, I just want our guests to know that it's a privilege for for me and for us to to be able to, um, you know, to enter this conversation with them. And at whatever point, however they want to continue it, we are available. And um, the Lord would have them to continue to wrestle with these things. And grow right. with I'm glad you said wrestle with these things, because if it's anything that's true about homeschooling, it's not a walk in the park. It's not sunshine and daisies all the time. It's where the real work of dominion takes place in the family. And mm -hmm. Whether or not you homeschool your children, we have been stressing from the beginning of this whole series that a Christian education is mandatory mm -hmm. to be faithful to God. If you're not providing a Christian education, then you're remiss in your duties. And mm -hmm. because we are in a household where the parents are not fully sanctified sinners and the children are not fully sanctified sinners, we're going to bump into each other. So if we are not standing on the rock, Jesus Christ, that collision or those collisions could knock us off our feet. But if we're standing on the rock in the normal day-to-day -day, uh, struggles of life, which are there because of sin, then we're able to maneuver. Mm -hmm. And this whole series really started as I was going through the Apostles' Creed again. Now, I say the Apostles' Creed regularly during worship services at church, and but I didn't really spend a lot of time, this sounds terrible, listening to what I was saying. Mm -hmm. Because once you understand that the Apostles' Creed was the baptismal oath that new believers took in the early church. Now, they didn't exactly say, okay, this is what the apostles said, but these were the fundamentals. And so if you're going to have a truly Christian education, these fundamentals have to be there because if mm -hmm. they're not there, then you're building on sand. You're not building on the rock. Right. And these fundamentals are the fundamentals of the Christian faith, the biblically Christian faith. Right. Now, I want to say one more thing, and that is, Andrea, you said that you were um, reciting the Apostles' Creed. There's a whole side of our listening audience that, that doesn't cite the Apostles' Creed. They may not ever have even heard of the Apostles' Creed. So before we, at some point, I want you to tell us what that Apostles' Creed says. And, um, you know, because because we, we may be aware of it, we may not be aware of it, but that's really important that, that right. this is the foundation of the biblically Christian faith. Right. It's what makes somebody a believer or not. Now, mm -hmm. a lot of people say, well, if they're regenerated by the Holy Spirit, that what makes a believer. Absolutely. Jesus sure. told Nicodemus, you must be born again. But part of being born again means that the Spirit of God lives within you and he is going to testify to truth. Yeah. Now, you might be surprised, and our listeners might be surprised, we've been doing the Apostles' Creed through this entire series, except I just didn't call it the Apostles' Creed. We started mm -hmm. off as God is creator, 
That's how mm -hmm. the Apostles' Creed starts. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, our creator of heaven and earth. And then we went into Jesus as our redeemer and the need for a redemption. And then we talked about the Holy Spirit. And we talked about um, predestination and having an attitude of victory. And we had um, lots of things that we were talking about that really I was all around the subject. And so I sort of waited till the end to say, my impetus for all this came from the Apostles' Creed. Well, today's episode is all about establishing your identity. And after the Apostles' Creed goes through the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, establishing Christianity as a Trinitarian faith. Mm -hmm. And it's important to realize that Christianity is the Trinitarian faith. Right. Other religions, either they have no concept of God as a person or they're Unitarian in terms of eliminating the idea of three persons and one God. Mm -hmm. So we don't have three gods, we have one God, but there are three persons in that God. Now, Islam doesn't hold to that. Islam says there's just one God and that God is Allah. So without getting into you know, disputing Islam as opposed to Christianity, the easiest thing to say is it's not Trinitarian. And in not being Trinitarian, it leads to things like statism and totalitarianism. So the only safeguard sinful man has in terms of ordering his society has to do with the Trinitarian God of the Bible. Yeah, we may have heard, I've heard people say, oh, just give me Jesus, just give me Jesus. And I think I know what they mean by that. I think I know what they mean, but we need to we need to know what we mean and mean what we say. And Jesus is not apart from the the Father and the Holy Spirit. So even well-meaning Christians who say just give me Jesus, they are not recognizing the triune God. And that's an offense to God. God wants yeah. to be worshipped as He has revealed Himself. Jesus over and over again speaks of the Father. Jesus tells us how to pray and says, this is how you pray our Father. So by denying the Trinity, either overtly or covertly or intentionally or unintentionally, we are subtracting not only from the faith as it's revealed in scripture, but in any ability to have a social order that honors God completely. Right. And that's why, as you said just now, you not only need to know what you believe, but you need to know why you believe it. And if that's not part of your home school, guess what will happen when your children are no longer absolutely beholden to you for their food, clothing, and shelter? Well, they uh, look yeah. other with they're going to look other where uh, other other places for that and you know there's a whole lot of um churches that are surprised i don't know why but they are surprised that the youth and the young people are leaving they're leaving the faith it's because we've not really passed down that um genuine uh article not i mean we can't save our children but we've not been faithful to god's revelation of himself and to walk in those ourselves. Exactly. Ken Ham of Answers in Genesis says it really well. If you throw out the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis, then there is no basis for anything else. Genesis meanings, meaning beginnings. That's where it all starts. That's where you're going to find the root of every doctrine. And right. Uh, so when that's attacked as mythological or not accurate or, you know, all sorts of isms that get attached to biblical Christianity, there's no foundation. So it's not just homeschooling isn't about this is what you need to know. This is what you need to know. It's this is truth. And only the Holy Spirit will ultimately reveal that to you. It won't be from mom and dad. We don't get to create born again Christians. We are the pointers. We point our finger and we say, this is what the word of God says, and you should do it. Now, while you're living in our house, you're going to yeah. do it and you're going to say the things that are appropriate. However, mm -hmm. it's your inner change that has to take place for you to even want to do it other than your mom and dad are saying you have to. Right. Because the scripture tells us that nobody comes to the son unless the father draws him. And so and that salvation is of the Lord. 
it also tells us that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So if we are not faithful to to reference that word of God, then then there's then we're missing a key element in that um, revelation of God to us and to our children. We right. are too easily settle for just doing a little church routine on the side instead right. of really digging in. And by God's grace, as the water heats up in the pot, mm. if you're not prepared on how to deal with it, how to turn down the heat, how to establish something right, then you're going to be a victim of evil as opposed to a dominion person who, in the name of Jesus Christ, is pursuing the kingdom of God, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which gets us to the subject of today, establishing your identity. Okay. Now, believe it or not, the Apostles' Creed has a lot to do with that. But let me just say this before I expound on that perspective. Today, we are amiss um, in terms of teaching foundational truths. And therefore, we have this somewhat epidemic, and it's not just confined to the heathen pagan people. It also touches people who claim to believe in God and be Christians, where people are struggling with their identity. It's not enough that they look down and say, oh, I'm a female or I'm a male. That used to be unquestioned. Why is it questioned now? Mm -hmm. Why is it questioned that marriage, which for thousands of years was understood to be a covenanted relationship between a man and a woman, why has that been challenged? Why is whether or not someone could be born with a particular orientation to something that is defined by scripture as sinful. And we're going to say, well, we shouldn't be harsh. You see, it all starts in the creedal belief of what it means to be a Christian. So I highly recommend anybody who cannot say the Apostles' Creed verbatim should go look it up and should make that a foundational aspect of everything. If any of what you're teaching isn't in line with that, then you're gonna have a problem with worldview and the application of that worldview to life. Okay. Okay, yeah. so now I talked about establishing our identity. The After the Apostles' Creed talks about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, it says, and I believe, and so keep in mind, that the Apostles' Creed is recited in the first person. It's not we, it's I believe. So mm -hmm. it can't be my mother and father believe, my grandmother twice removed on this side used to believe. This is a my personal pastor. statement of faith. Mm -hmm. And when children are baptized, when infants are baptized, clearly they don't understand what's being done. But that's why we talk about baptismal vows of their sponsors, their godparents, no matter what tradition you have, is that the parents or the grown-ups in the family, whether it's be an aunt or an uncle or grandparent, whoever is raising the children, is promising that these children are going to be raised in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So whether or not the baby at eight days old or three months old understands it, he, should, he or she should be hearing it from the time they're hearing anything. And so they should be included in family devotions if there are other children. They should participate. And then what a glorious thing to say, there's never been a time where I wasn't hearing the word of God and the doctrines of the faith. Mm -hmm. Okay. But this is how the Apostles' Creed ends. And I believe in the communion of saints the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Okay. Now, okay. there's your identity. I'm part of a communion of saints. I am part of the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. There's your identity. I believe in the forgiveness of sins. This communion of saints is made up of forgiven sinners. So I have no reason to boast. I didn't do this myself. Mm -hmm. This is mm -hmm. as a result of God's grace. God, the father, God, the son, God, the Holy spirit. Right. So the communion of saints, I'm part of the body of Christ. 
That means I should treat the body of Christ well. You know, when my when my ankle hurts, my response isn't to go kick it. Right. How many Christians, when they disagree with other Christians, their solution is to go kick the ankle? Oh, gee, that works. Mm -hmm. So now the foot that you kick the ankle with, now that hurts. You see? Yeah. So if we don't have our identity, no matter how, how much we have doctrinal differences, brothers and sisters in Christ and the Holy Spirit will make that apparent to us because Jesus said, you'll know them by their fruits, right? Yeah. So when we see the fruits of the Spirit, even if we ascribe to different catechisms or whatever it is, we are judging them according to God's word and we must treat them as brothers and sisters in Christ. Right. There's of a, course, um, it's when you break down the family and uh -huh. as communism and Marxism likes to do and statism, then how do people really look at themselves as the family of God? They've already yeah. got a sweet look. Yeah. We don't have the physical family. Well, the physical family or the, um, traditional family, I would say, is um, is certainly under attack in every every direction. So so when that starts coming apart, we certainly don't have a frame of reference for the um, family of God. But I want to make a note that the um, the term communion of saints, other people might refer to it as the fellowship of the saints. So, right. you know, I'm from Virginia and I live in Virginia right now. And I've lived in Tennessee, Texas, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, and South Carolina, and Pennsylvania for a while. And I tell you, most folks think that fellowship is about fried chicken and mashed potatoes <laughs> and the things that you bring to the dinner table. But there's more to that fellowship, you know, and right. that is that is the um, the recognition that we are all um, sinners saved by grace and that is the thing that we have in common that is the thing that met that put brings us together no matter what foods on the table no matter what denomination we belong to or or you know whether we even know the apostles creed or not there is that um uh the holy spirit bearing witness from one to another if, right. if we are sensitive to that. Well, we have to know what to look for. We have to know yep. what the fruits of the spirit are. And it's not just a list of things that you can check off. Um, there are people who have extremely faulty, you might say academic theology who live well beyond their theological positions. And what you're seeing is the manifestation of the Holy Spirit in them. And so recognizing our identity in Christ, and then as a result of our identity in Christ, we have these brothers and sisters who come from different mothers, but come from Jesus Christ, and that's our identity. And that we must remember that we, and they, and our children, and our grandchildren that are born or not yet born, these are all sinners in need of God's grace. It doesn't give us license to therefore kill them in the womb. It doesn't give us license to be nasty or uncaring about them. But if we don't have the standard of what it means to be a believer, everybody's not a believer just because they say they are. I mean, the whole immigration uh, discussion today has to do with whether or not someone should be having a benefit of being a citizen and a citizen usually had the benefits of being able to vote and being able to do various things. Well, that's what the debate is about, how you should look at certain people. So how you should look at immigrants or how you should look at citizens. Well, putting that discussion aside, if everybody's a believer because everybody's nice, then we have lost the distinction. And so the communion of saints means that we are part of a group and that group is membership only comes by means of invitation and election. It doesn't come because, you know, I persuaded six people to come on in and call themselves Christian. Mm -hmm. Right. That invitation um, and um, what you say, invitation and election, election that, that God elects. God. 
that's right. the invitation and election of God, not a common, um, not a um, democratic vote that we like this person. So we're going to let them in. Right. Or, you know, an appeal so that you can get more people sitting in your chairs. Right. Right. So right. the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins. In other words, if your identity and your children's identity is in, I'm a forgiven sinner and I'm a forgiven sinner only if I am part of the body of Christ by means of regeneration. And how do I know? Well, the scripture says, as many who are led by the spirit have the right to be called the children of God. So a really good test is, am I being led by the spirit? Well, the spirit's not going to contradict the word. So we've got a way in which to view it for ourselves. So if people are, I wonder if I'm really saved. I always say, are you being led by the spirit? Is it consistent with the word of God? Uh, no, I'm, you know, living with somebody and I'm not married or, you know, I go to movies and I watch, uh, uh, I listen to music that's very ungodly and actually contrary to it. I said, well, then you might have reason to be concerned. Doesn't look yeah. like you're being led by the spirit. Right. We can't say that we are, um, we can't identify ourselves as Christians just because we've had, we've, we've been baptized or because we sit in a pew. It does have to have that. We, we have to examine ourselves and see if we are indeed in Christ. And we know that because Holy Spirit's in us. Right. And that is, like you say, not contrary to his word. Right. He's leading a, us into truth. He's convicting us of sin. And so. Right. So we're familiar with the term treason when it has to do with the national government. So what right. does it mean to be in treason to your country? Well, let's take that concept. What does it mean to be in treason to your God? Mm. Yeah, we don't really think about that. Yeah, we should. We should think about we more. Should. We should. Because the other two factors after the communion of saints and the forgiveness of sins, it's the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Now, the resurrection of the body and life everlasting tells us that this life is not the end. Mm -hmm. Right. So Anybody who is looking to move into nothingness is going to be very disappointed because it's not going to go away. God is not going to go away. Okay. Mm -hmm. Which means if you have a rough spot in life, suicide is not the answer because there'll be a resurrection of the body and life everlasting. The question will be, where will that life everlasting be? Mm -hmm. Will it be in the presence of our Lord? Or will, will, will it be in hell, which is a place? It's a situation. If heaven, if hell is not real, then heaven is not real. Right. And the Apostle Paul tells us, if we have no hope of the resurrection, pity you Christians. You're walking around with a pipe dream. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But then he right. then says, it's not a pipe dream. It's true. And anyone who has the Holy Spirit knows that when people corner them who aren't believers and try to say, okay, so tell me how it's true. Convince me. We have to say, honestly, there's no way I can convince you because I didn't convince myself. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So then they'll say, oh, it's just subjective. Well, certainly we receive our relationship with God in a subjective way because we're individual people but it doesn't make the gospel and the law subjective. There are objective truths that we receive subjectively, but that's where I said it goes back to what are the basic tenets of the faith? If you don't know, then how do you have a way to judge it? Yeah, you don't. That's the question. You don't know. It's like that, um, you know, you've heard uh, about the cashier studying money. They don't study the counterfeit. They go and they look at, at the real thing. So we have to behold the real, um, the real God, um, so that we can know, um, that, that, uh, counterfeit. So, so life everlasting, you know, we have sometimes people have the, the misconception that, you know, like all dogs go to heaven. We've talked about that's not true for dogs nor but well, we I don't know if we talked about it, if that's true for dogs but we know that it's not true for people but you we have you have the idea floating around out there that when people die 
that they just sort of float around on these little clouds in heaven and don't have a body like they're separated and um so you know um that's that stuff that's not really real and I, and i think that um it's important to make the distinction for our children between that which is true and real and eternal and those things that is somebody else's um um what's it called you know myth or theory or or whatever or delusion I, delusion or delusion yeah. right right yeah um so so if if children are going to be truly prepared to either go into higher education if where they feel they're particularly called requires that they, you know, get their union card to become a lawyer or a doctor or medical, like a nurse or something like that. Mm -hmm. But we need to realize that they're going into enemy territory if the place they're going to be educated does not believe in God in three persons and the necessity for salvation. And that all historical accounts and everything else need to be viewed through these lenses. So if you want your children to not stray from the faith as far as it pertains to you, then teach them honestly and truly. And don't worry so much about can they um, give you the Pythagorean theorem or can they name all the Tudor and Stuart kings or can they diagram the sentence or whatever all useful things in certain fields. But right. if they cannot give a reason for the hope that's within them, if they cannot give an apologetic for the Christian faith, and if they're not willing to stand on their identity as part of the communion of saints, part of the group of people whose sins have been forgiven, and this isn't what is prominent in their mind, then they're going to be swayed by are you a girl and really identify as a boy? Or are you somebody who, um, you know, decides that, well, you know, I used to think, my parents used to teach me that uh, we were created uh, and God ordained our days as opposed to evolution. And then go to the, the easier way because everybody else is saying it. But none of those will give them real answers. And guess what? The resurrection of the body and the life everlasting is for those who are in Christ to spend eternity with God. And if a parent really believes that, then that's going to be the most important thing that parent can convey. And that's the foundation of the curriculum. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah. And, you know, I, I think that it's important that we understand that, that this, um, the way that we're talking about these things is really very much kind of as we go. We want folks to learn to do this as we go. For example, um, you know, it doesn't have to be a very, you know, in the box structured formal thing. My, I've been on uh, grandma duty for the past few days. I had a little fella over here and he was building Lego building with his Legos. And he told me that he was building a tower. It was going to go higher, 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 all the way up to the sky. And he was going to have all the power. And I was like, Oh, that reminds me of a Bible story. You know, there's this, these guys, they wanted to build a tower. They wanted to get all the power. And God said, no, because God is the only one that has all the power. And he says, Oh, you know, and it was just, you know, that simple and that matter of fact. And in, even in his play, you can see even in, in the, our children's play, how and where they, you can just implement these, these little, you know, I say little concepts. It's really a huge thing to recognize that God is, is God almighty. He's the only one that has all the power. None of our towers, none of our towers are going to be big, big enough. They'll all be destroyed. But, you know, it's it is an as can be as we go. And um, uh, we can do this because we are disciples of Christ and we're called to make disciples. Right. So what should a parent do if he or she says, wow, I'm kind of late to this party. Uh, will I ever catch up? The answer is 
you're never late to the party. When God opens your mm -hmm. eyes, that's your invitation to the party and you're there. So no regrets in terms of spending a lot of time saying, oh, if we had just done this five years ago, that's taking away time from right now. Right. So get yourself a good catechism. There's a number of them. As a matter of fact, I went through all of them with my children because they have slightly different permutations. And then you get a chance to discuss doctrine together. And mm -hmm. so there's the Heidelberg Catechism. There is the Westminster Catechism. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a catechism, I forget the name of it, but it's part of the Book of Common Prayer that has Anglican roots. And these are all reformed in their orientation in as much as what they're going to be is relying on Christ alone, grace alone, the sufficiency of scripture, things like that. So mm -hmm. that's what you should do. And you know what? You've got plenty of time to do it. You do. No, really? But yeah. Read a, read a catechism question and answer as part of before you, if you're having a family meal. And then instead of talking about the latest baseball team or whatever it is, talk about that and ask your kids what that means and discuss it. And then if you're in the car and you've got a student who um, is learning to read and his reading level has gotten pretty good, well, you know, we're driving. I want you to read this for everybody. In other words, incorporate it. You, you want to do handwriting practice? Have them write out the catechism. Mm -hmm. Or even the Bible. You can yeah, start well, writing. Yeah, Bible. they can start writing the Bible. The Bible's going to take them a little longer. Uh, a catechism sure. question and answer is a little shorter, but you can do that as well. The point being is we have such good news. We have life-giving information that comes right out of the words of Scripture. Why, as homeschoolers, would we spend a lot of time on less important things at the expense of something like this. Yeah, we don't want to. We don't want to be uh, guilty of doing that. We don't. No, no. All right. Well, the series is done. We had eight segments of it. I will post these all in one place on the Calcedon page so people can access them. They're already. All our videos are already on there. But if we do it this way, then they can find it all in one place. And we're going to take a break for next week and come back with another series. I'm not going to tell you what it is because I want you to come back and find out. And uh, thanks, Nancy, for um, having these conversations with me. I really appreciate that opportunity. It's my privilege and pleasure. Thank you. All right. See you next time. All righty. Thank you for joining Andrea Schwartz and the Kingdom Driven Family Podcast. Holding up the family and self-government as a true and lasting means of transforming society. Please visit thekingdomdrivenfamily.com and reconstructionistradio.com.